I wanted to start out by telling a little story. Um, and this is kind of how my work is in being informed now. Um, the story begins with this uh, Chinese porcelain vase. And this vase was created in the early 1700s. Um, and it is attributed, there's a stamp on the bottom referring it to the Kang Dynasty. It's often referred to as the three-stringed vase or um, a peach bloom vase for the color and also the distinct stripes on the neck. Um, its most famous owner was a woman by the name of Mary Jane Morgan. And this is also referred to as the Morgan vase. Um, Mrs. Morgan was the wife of a very wealthy shipping heir and who was very frugal throughout her entire life up until 1878 when her husband passed away. And at this time, she went on a wild and crazy rampant art buying spree, make judgments if you will, um, and in the next seven years amassed an incredible collection of art. Um, when she passed away in 1885, her entire collection was put on auction, and this auction was highly publicized in New York City, and even this very nice uh, book was published. They, they apparently spent $40,000 publishing these books for the auction and dropped them off at the mansions of all the richest people in New York City. So during this auction, um, the headlining piece, which was the Morgan Vaz, um, sold for an unprecedented amount of $18,000 to a man by the name of William T. Walters who is now, um, which is now the Walters Art Museum in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, so controversy arose over this, because if you can imagine, in 1886, $18,000 was an incredible amount of money to buy for one piece of, piece of work. Um, so controversy arose after M Mr. Walters came came back to Baltimore and denied the fact that he bought this vase to the Baltimore Sun. Um, so it started this feud between New York newspapers, one claiming he paid, one claiming he didn't. And it kind of started this fury and huge controversy amongst collectors in New York. So glass companies latched onto this and started immediately creating glass and also porcelain um, around the same kind of, kind of um, patterning. This vase, um, made by the Wheeling Company in West Virginia, um, and this is actually sometimes mistaken for the original um, vase and because of its very similar uh, qualities. But this is actually glass. So other companies began making peach blow, which is the term they refer to it in glass. And it was this huge craze in the US. Um, companies began producing it, and a lot of it had patterning on it. Um, there was even fashions related to it, um, and even a cocktail named after it. A town in Colorado was named Peach Flow, Colorado, which is now defunct. But um, at one time, there was a town. Um, so, which brings us to the current um, piece that was on the poster. Um, I didn't really know any of the story but um, to begin with, but my friends um, were blowing glass at a place called Wheaton, Wheaton Village, um, the Creative Glass Center of America in New Jersey, and they were pretty keen to the fact that I was started using this recycled kind of glass in my work, and at Wheaton, they uh, melted a whole batch of this recycled peach blow and they pulled me a bunch of rod which I then used to um, flame work this piece. So um, I titled this peach piece Peach Blow Away um, in reference to kind of the um, popularity and fashion of this type of glass and actually the glass industry in the US really going out of fashion or at least the, the pressed glass industry in the US. Um, so I wanted to skip to back to kind of my beginnings as a student. I always like to hear where an artist came from. 
And everyone always asks, oh, you're a glass artist. Where, why did you think you would do that? And luckily for me, I have a very distinct pinpoint to this. Um, when I was about seven or eight years old, I found these little pink elephant, we call the swizzle sticks, um, in my parents' basement cabinet. And I was just obsessed. That was it for me. So I wanted to know how to make these. And um, so I went to school. This is the only picture I can find of the studio now. But I went to school at a place called Salisbury University in Maryland, which um, is a very modest studio and art school. It, it actually wasn't an art school. It was a liberal arts college in, in New Jersey. I got away with telling telling my parents I was going to go to this school because I knew that they had a glass program and they would let me go to this school right away. So, um, But I did a study abroad program in Rome um, my junior year and after that I came back to little Salisbury, Maryland and I just was not, was not having it anymore there. So I'd seen the world. So um, after I graduated I med immediately moved Run into U-Haul and moved all my stuff to uh, Brooklyn, New York, um, where I'd met some friends in Italy that lived there. And I started working at a studio um, by the name of 160 Glass in Brooklyn, and for a woman named Michiko Sakano, um, who really has been a huge um, influence in my practice. She's a, an amazing glassblower and businesswoman there. So for two years, I, um, I was her assistant, a uh, glassblowing assistant. I worked at tons of different jobs, um, was a glassblowing assistant for a lot of people in New York. And I charged the furnace, meaning I filled up the furnace and um, swept the floors at 160 for two years just so I could blow glass. So um, I also taught at a place called Urban Glass. And I taught classes for. Um, the Boys and Girls Club of Brooklyn. I did some flame working classes there and had some really amazing students at that time. Um, another job I did in New York was I worked as a maker and designer of upscale men's cufflinks. And um, they had a very good marketing campaign, which afforded me a really nice little uh, private flame working studio. I think this picture is hilarious because I look like really mad to be having my picture taken or something. But um, it was actually a very, very nice studio for, for that time in New York. Um, during this time, I was making some works um, where I was basically taking, um, flame working all these um, parts and then incorporating them into blown vessels. Um, you know, I was working a lot in glass, but I just, at that time, I was working so much just to afford living in New York City that I didn't have time to make a lot of my own work. Um, but these were some other pieces I did. Um, one day I was at Urban Glass, and there was a poster up that said, blow glass in the Caribbean. And I said, absolutely. So. Um, I went to a place called Maho Bay Eco Resort um, in St. John Virgin Islands. And um, what they do there is um, they're using, they're collecting all the bottles on the, that people are drinking on the island and washing them, breaking them, and throwing them into a furnace and then blowing <laughs> glass with them. So it was there that I really started kind of my um, interest in the possibilities of working with recycled glass and second, second life glass. Um, this was my flame working studio. And Richard keeps saying, oh, you know, our flame working studio is not so great. But com you know, that was <laughs> so I'm like, this is great. Um, but yeah, this is our Anila iguana. Um, so I also was applying for a lot of different things at that time, just anything I could kind of get, get my hands on. Um, and I did a residency um, in Red Wing, Minnesota, at this place called the Anderson Center, which was um, a factory where they invented puffed wheat. So um, it was a really nice place. And 
this man was the head of the little studio there. I made some some more of these kind of um, works, kind of dealing with freezing uh, process and uh, m movement. <clears throat> um, at that time, I also started um, to be the teaching assistant for a man named Gianni Toso, and um, who has been really a technical influence on me. Um, at that time, I was basically writing to to artists and saying, "Hey, can I please TA for you?" I couldn't afford to take classes, and most of them said no, but you know, some of them said yes, which was really amazing. And um, so I started TAing for Gianni, which has been, you know, a relationship that has really been very beneficial to me in many ways. Um, and also the ex experience to go to Corning. Um, so I went back to New York City after having done all these amazing things. And I'd been there for about five years. And I felt like all I was doing was this, was just waiting for a train. <laughs> And sitting on a train, and I was just, I was just done with it. Um, I just couldn't make my work there. It was very, very difficult. Um, so I applied to grad school, and um, you know, at this point, I was like, I'm either going to go to grad school and really do this, or I'm going to become a pastry chef. So I got into grad school, and um, I went to a, a school called. Tyler School of Art in Philadelphia, which had just renovated their facility. And it's the year before I arrived. And they have a really amazing um, facility now. And I'm very lucky to be a part of that. Um, so you know, I took, I took grad school full on. I noticed you guys like that saying. So um, and really jumped into it. Um, this was a piece that I had made. Um, at the beginning, and um, <clears throat> this this piece was kind of dealing with um, fragility, and it, it actually ended up being a very strong um, form, but everyone was so scared of me walking. I would just walk around with it all nonchalant, and everyone was freaking out around me, but it was actually not as delicate as it seemed, I guess. Um, this image, you know, Sometimes glass is very hard to photograph, but this image was a piece, flamework piece I made out of borosilicate glass, and um, it was kind of dealing with the idea of when you're walking through at night and you're looking up at the trees, you kind of um, feel like you're falling or it gets really uh, disoriented. So this is quite a large wall installation I did. Um, you know, and I'm, I'm very, really committed to the material of glass, um, and I, I think I always will be, but most of my influences, my major influences, have all been um, at sculptors. So, um, you know, including um, mostly, mostly strong female sculptors like um, Eva Hess, who I honestly go to for advice pretty regularly. Um, Tara Donovan, um, it's a coin. So um, during that time, I also, this was, also didn't photograph too well, but this piece is entitled, you probably think this piece is about you. Um, <laughs> It was kind of like a dark room, and when you walked into the room, it almost looked like a huge oasis. Um, the lights shining on it looked like a pool of water, almost. And when you walked into it, um, these are all kind of um, hot cast, I guess. Um, it all said you in it, the whole thing. So this was another piece I made at that time, um, um, quite large. Um, suspended piece and I was thinking about um, when you go into you know a natural history museum and you see the um, a big animal uh, bone structure or something like that was my original thought but it didn't really turn out exactly like I'd imagine I liked the piece but 
the tallest one of these is about the height of me. Um, and this was in a, in a show um, called The Endangered City. And in Philadelphia, there's a lot of old abandoned factory buildings. And after I made this piece, I really imagined it being in one of these um, buildings and where it was going to be located. Um, so it ended up getting in a show dealing with kind of these abandoned uh, properties. This is another image of that. I was using a lot of uh, maybe different materials at that time, metal and foam. Um, that summer, I had the opportunity to take a class from a man named Emilio Santini and, um, and then to be the assistant for um, a man named Lawrence Stump. And, you know, with, with flame working and with glass blowing in general, it's, um, you really need to learn from someone. And at, when I started at Salisbury, there wasn't any flame shop, and I pretty much just um, bought a torch and started working. I had no idea what I was doing. And for two years, I had no idea what I was doing. And then I finally took a class um, from a man named Shane Farrow, and he was basically like, you have no idea what you're doing. So, um, so it's really important to learn the craft from other people. Um, so at this time, I was able to visit um, the Corey Museum of Glass. And um, you know, my favorite pieces to this day are still these kind of really strange um, dioramas made in the 1700s um, in France. They're called, there's figures and then there's these dioramas and the figures are called um, Nivea figurines. There's not a ton of history on these, um, but I've been kind of trying to build it a little bit. But tiny, tiny little parts made, in, made up into a composition. When I came back, I made this piece um, called, um, I titled this piece, The Revelation of a Circuit, which is like an Egyptian goddess bringing people into the afterlife. And this piece actually sits into the wall um, so it, you're looking at it, and it's kind of this optical illusion going in there, um, about uh, 22 by 22 inches. Sorry, I was I was gonna convert everything into centimeters, but I I failed on that one. Um, <clears throat> so this piece was really kind of a turning point for me in grad school. Um, it was, I felt like I finally found the way I wanted to work. And um, I was making, just flame working all these tiny, tiny parts and then putting them into these compositions, almost like a painting. And it really gave me the ability to work larger than um, flame working usually has the capability of doing. Um, and another kind of breakthrough came when Making that last piece, I was spending so much money on glass, and it was, I wanted to go bigger and bigger with my pieces, but I, I just honestly could not afford it. I was spending two or three hundred dollars a week just buying glass. And this kind of, the client glass I use is Venetian, and it's even the cheaper kind of glass. So um, I found these barrels um, behind the furnaces at Tyler, and they had most likely been bought by John Clark, our former head, probably 30 years ago, or else by one of the other grad students. And these, um, this glass is called, um, it's from a company called Gabbert Cullet in West Virginia. And they basically supply, are supplied with their um, glass from a company named Fenton in the, U in the US. So, I found these barrels and I was, you know, just confused about why they were there, but basically this glass is very hard to, to blow with, to blow glass with, but I was like, I'm just going to try this, you know, and so, and it worked perfectly for me in the flame working studio. Um, so this barrel was from a post factory production of um, Easter candy dishes. So from that, I made this 
piece, um, which is titled Basket. And after, you know, the glass is very pink in its raw form, but once flame worked, um, it really gets kind of this red reduction on it, and it's really oozy and, and kind of repulsive. Um, perfect. So, um, you know, and if you can see, there's little rabbits in there. See the one in the middle? Um, this was the actual pieces that it was made from. <laughs> this and little roosters. Um, <clears throat> so this was a piece that was in my, my thesis show. And, um, you know, so this, my show was um, really kind of built around um, textures and um, kind of, you know, the texture of kind of like a material seduction um, something that lures you in and you want you want to look at it and you want to touch it but it also is totally repulsing to you and you're afraid of it um, this piece is called milk and it was made from um, the majority of uh, a barrel of just milk glass scraps And in this piece, um, you can see in the corner here, this kind of little round pattern. I started um, digging deeper into the history of this glass I was using and found out um, from the Fenton website that I was finding all these little stamps and I was curious as to what they were. So I found out that these are called basket handler stamps. And at the Fenton factory, there's um, each gaffer, which is the head glass maker, um, has their own particular signature. And this signature is used to stamp the handles of the baskets that they make. And on their website, there's stamps and the name of the people that were making them. So I've dated the glass for that white, um, white piece to about the mid-1970s, determining I found two stamps in this barrel and kind of putting them them together. This is another piece from the show. It's about 47 inches. The black on this is all um, recycled black Fenton. Um, this piece is called Spike, also from the show. And um, with this piece, I was also thinking about, um, you know, kind of some sensations and feelings and maybe about, like, the feeling you get when, when someone kind of unexpectedly does something nice for you in a little way and you get kind of the shooting, tingling up your back, um, although it is a little frightening. It's, there I am. Um, after that, that summer, um, I really just wanted to relax because I was, I was working, you know, 14 hour days for my, for my show. And I took two trips that summer. Um, one, oh, that doesn't look good. Um, one to the Museum Dia Beacon in upstate New York. And this is actually an Agnes Martin piece, but you can't really see it. Um, and but at the Dia, I was really inspired by um, the works of Agnes Mar Martin and Saul Lewitt and kind of how they had this really whitewashed um, but really strong imagery to them. Now it's just so subtle but really um, makes you realize distinctions. And I also did my last class of grad school um, in Rome, Italy. Hard life, I know. But... Um, and they, you know, even though these were more ornate, they also had kind of this really whitewashed um, sense of um, something having at one time been really brilliant, um, and now it's kind of been, you know, dusted and had its time. Um, so after that, I came back and made this piece um, called uh, Prop in the House of Livia. Um, the next year, 
I was really fortunate to have them invite me back to Tyler as um, the resident for the year, and which is great because I, I love the community of a school, and um, I don't know what I would have done all by myself, but it's nice to have people around. So I started, you know, the glass really kind of, using the recycle kind of really cracked it open for me. And um, I was like, well, if I can use this, why can't I use, I can use anything, you know? So I started making these, um, these reconstructed pieces. Um, a lot of them using all white. Um, and I titled this series um, Reincarnate to Wreckage. And, you know, I think of these works as kind of taking a, a, a second look at the industry that was before the studio glass movement. You know, an industry that, that we actually owe some gratitude to, but is really overlooked now. Um, and, you know, on their own, these pieces are kind of sad, you know, downtrodden. Um, you know, they're kind of trying to put themselves together after loss. And, but really, you know, they have a f kind of this forlorn future of they're never going to be looked at on their own as, you know, objects of desire. Um, I find them on thrift store shelves. I go to the Salvation Army and buy them for 50 cents or a dollar. And I collect um, multiple of the same pieces and then take one, break it up, and then flame work the parts and reconstruct them in the hot shop. So, that color's quite... Yeah. I was really into white for a while. I think I still am. It might, it might not quite be over yet. Um, this piece was made um, out of two lampshades. So I basically just found these lampshades, broke them, reconstructed them. Um, this piece, uh, I named it Hobnail Corsage. And it was made out of um, three of these vases, which are really common in thrift stores in the US. Once I started making this work, people were uh, yeah. People are just leaving me stuff. It's great. I don't even have to buy it anymore. People finding it at yard sales and dropping it to me. And it's amazing. No one wants this stuff, so they, they give it to me, and then I make something better out of it. So it's a little bright, the color, but this piece is called um, FTD 1975. And, you know, I started really looking at the stamp. Most of this glass has a stamp on the bottom. And this piece, a lot of the glass on the thrift store shelves is made um, or is there from the Flores Trans Transworld Delivery Service, which is, you know, this was once given as a vase for, you know, celebration or a loss or something like that. And then it's given away eventually. Um, so I was finally, I was finally broken out of my white stage um, when I found, um, oh, what did I do? Sorry. Timed out. Um, there we go. Um, there we go. Okay. So. I went into an antique store in New Jersey and found this whole set of just this incredible transpa deep transparent red um, dishware. And um, I flipped over the bottom and on the bottom there's a stamp that said Avon. And I just thought it was hilarious um, to think of the Avon ladies a little in their little pink Cadillacs and their pink. I was trying to sell this totally goth red dishware. Um, so this um, this piece is entitled Avon Goes Goth. And um, but then I started actually researching it and found out that it's from a collection that Avon did um, called the 1876 Cape Cod Collection. 
And the pattern was actually an original, taken from original pattern of from the Boston and Sandwich Glass Company, which is kind of the golden age of glass. And this was the original patterning. So it actually does have this really interesting history. I just, I just had to kind of amp up the pink ladies with goth dishware look. So um, at the time I was, you know, I do a little uh, experimenting and I have some pieces, a lot of pieces I'm working on at the same time. This is a little piece I call um, Homeland. And it's kind of just this chunk of, I don't know, chunk of spacey earth or something, or maybe not earth. But I named it Homeland because, not totally political, but I just think that that word has gotten such a bad rap in the U.S. lately. So I wanted to bring it back to something a little lighter. I finally had the, um, had the, chance to go to, to the Fenton factory. And um, this is an image from the 70s of some of the real studio glass movement people, which is amazing. I, I just love this picture because I'm actually redoing the same cake plate right now for someone, a commission. Um, so I go to the cullet yard and this guy comes out and he looks like about 120 years old and gives me a barrel, and I fill it up with all this glass. It's amazing. Yeah, at a dollar a pound. Yeah, so then I do a lot of this, just ruffling. In that barrel was um, this color called chocolate, which is so amazing, and it kind of oozes from this really light skin to a dark kind of flesh. This is original Fenton, and I made this kind of little piece called my little Yoshi piece. Um, there's all these like weird animals and weird little figures in with the cullet. And I just like, they're so funny. I like using them. This is kind of just, yeah. I just took three pieces I found and just kind of fused them together in the hot shop. I started also looking at some um, glass, other glass I was finding on thrift store shelves and researching the history. This is from a factory called the Indiana Glass Factory. Now that I'm getting really into this second hand, you know, it's getting more expensive again because I really want this banana dish, which is like $120. So my original plan of keeping it cheap is not, not working so well. But um, this is a commission piece I've recently done for um, an artist named Nick, Nick Cripple and um, Jeff Mongrain. And this was shown at the um, Enseca conference at... Um, of the St. James Cathedral. Um, during Lent, they take out all the color from the church. And then, um, so I made this white crown of Lenten roses. Um, I also work for a man named Paul Stankard, who's kind of um, legendary in the glass world. And um, I've been training for a while. Um, I'm now the bee maker, so. Um, which is, I trained for about a month and a half just to make one of these bees. And I think it's so funny because the work I do in an eight-hour day fits into one little tiny Petri dish. <laughs> so that's my work for a whole day. But they're really hard. Um, I also recently did um, this residency at the Toledo Museum of Art. Um, this year marks the 50th anniversary of the Studio Glass Movement which was basically started by a man named Harvey Littleton um, by these two workshops. And I'm going to go into more of this um, in a lecture next Thursday about this residency. But um, I was using, in the original workshop, they used these marbles, which are from a fiberglass company. And we used the same glass. So my project was to base my works around um, these marbles. So this was a, the barrel of our, of our work, um, of our cullet, basically. Um, it was me and two other artists. Matt, um, one of the other ones was Matt Zaz, who was a previous Proctor Fellow, too. You guys have very good taste. So. Um. <clears throat> This was a piece of Libby glass I reconstructed, which I'll talk about a little bit 
um, next week. Um, so on to Australia. And, you know, for, for the time I was here, I was really thinking about um, kind of I had a few, I have a few thoughts going on. Um, and one of them was I'd originally thought about landscape and kind of a broad landscape. And then when I got here, I realized it's going to be an underwater landscape in a way. Um, and I, the other two things I've been thinking about are um, Chinese privacy screens and um, this phrase um, behind the blue curtain, meaning the surface of the ocean, and kind of how um, both of these things, you know, are transparent but yet um, keep keep a distance in in this way. Um, so I've been using all. Uh, just wine bottles. So if anyone would like to leave me their their wine bottles, I'll be over there. Um, and you know the glasses really. I've been using the olive type glass. Um, when I first applied, I guess I didn't realize that um, Australia doesn't have kind of the really old history of the factories, and I wanted to use local recycled. And this seemed like very uh, practical. And now I'm really enjoying the way that it's coming out. Um, it has a very, um, you know, kind of this seaweed kind of um, kelp thing going on. Um, so I wanted to end with just another little story. Um, I, I have a show coming up when I get back at um, a gallery called the Heller Gallery in New York, which I'm very excited about. It's kind of my first big um, show. Uh, New York show, and I've been basing it around um, the I, the I, the first story that I told you about the peach blow, but also about um, Burmese glass, which came um, came out around the same time as peach blow, and this glass was invented um, in about 1885 by a man named Frederick Shirley, and he presented this glass to Queen Victoria. And she exclaimed um, that it reminded her of a Bur Burmese sunset. So that's how it got the name um, Burmese. So they, they stopped. This was originally produced by the Mount Washington Company. And they stopped producing this glass in 1900. Um, and the, the formula for this was pretty much lost um, by glass factories. So in the 1960s, um, Fenton wanted to redo this color, and um, they hired a man by the name of Charlie Go, and they actually hired Charlie because um, he was in the in the church a cappella choir with Frank Fenton, who owned Fenton, and Charlie had no glass experience, but he wanted to keep Charlie around because he didn't want to get rid of him from the choir, so he hired him as a glass chemist. And, um, but he got really into it and actually became one of their top chemists. Um, he was really interested in recreating some of these formulas from the early 1900s. So um, Charlie's father died when, um, he was, when he was in his early 30s. And so when Charlie um, turned, turned 30, 30, he started getting really paranoid. And, but he kept on at his work and spent years and years trying to figure out this formula for Burmese glass. Um, so in 1969, um, he finally figured out the formula. And one morning pulled out, um, opened the, the kiln, the kneeler, and there, there it was. He finally found the formula for the Burmese glass. And went running down the hall to, to Frank Fenton and said, I found it, I found it. And um, that night, Charlie went to play racquetball. And afterwards, he died of a heart attack. <laughs> so, <laughs> quite he's, morbid. He's <laughs> yeah, he lived, I think he lived three years longer than his father. But he saw it, he saw it to fruition. So, um, that's my story. Thank you.